Yeah, so my name is Ron Freisagdai. I uh, uh, work as a professor of internet security at the University of Twente, uh, all the way in Enschede, but I live in Arnhem, so I didn't have to travel that far to get here. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, uh, post-quantum, uh, so not about quantum itself, but what do we do after quantum becomes a thing, and I'm going to uh, say a few words about that in, this, in the context of um, identity management, because that's why we're here. Um, oh, come on, you can do it. Next slide. Ah, the, 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 the people in the back are doing something, so I can click this. Huh? Yeah. Ooh. Oh, it's, 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 uh, this, is, this is when you know it's a real conference again, right? Problems with the technology, it's, it's great. So I want a show of hands, who's not heard of quantum computing? Show, put up your hand, all of you have heard of this, right? So this is, a, this is a, you want to put your hand up? You can do it, come on, come on, be brave, be the only one to put your hand up. You've heard of quantum computing, but does it also not mean that you know what, what it is? Do you know what quantum computing is? Um, so quantum computing is a hype. That's what I claim here. Um, uh, and it's, it, it can be a very useful hype, but at the moment, it's really a hype. I've, I assume all of you are familiar with this, this nice thing that Gartner always does, the hype cycle. Um, and if you look at the headlines, they tell you that this is a hype. This is something that people have heard about. They think it's a cool thing. It sounds really nice, right? It sounds like a James Bond move, movie, Quantum. Um, but they don't really know what it is. And I hope to tell you something about that. Um, and maybe some of you have seen this. This was in uh, 2019. This is a, an article from uh, Nature. So uh, uh, we as scientists all want to uh, have high quality publications that are that our peers really appreciate and, and it doesn't get much better than nature or science um, This by the way is at least uh, a record holder for the number of authors on the paper. It's this is absolutely crazy uh, And this is a paper by uh, Google uh, About a quantum computing result that they achieved and they said we have achieved quantum supremacy And when somebody says quantum supremacy my brain does this uh, uh, right, so uh, uh, it's, it sounds like a really cool term, but what does it really tell you? Well, what they mean with quantum uh, supremacy is that they have built a quantum computer that can execute a task faster than a quote-unquote classic computer, like you all have in your pocket, your phone, can execute that same task. And that can be really relevant. Um, Okay, and I can't resist, we are at the end of the day, I'm standing between you and drink, so we need a, a couple more jokes in here. Uh, uh, so the question is, quantum computing, is it the end of blockchain? Hands up who think this is the end of blockchain? Oh, at least, in, <laughs> at least in terms of hypes, but also actually technically it could be the end of blockchain, and, and at the end of my presentation I hope you understand why. Um, the thing is that this hype isn't helpful at all. Right, because news sites are abuzz with quantum. Every, if you follow the tech news sites, there are articles about quantum. Uh, and it may seem like quantum computing is just around the corner. It's going to be another year and we've got a quantum computer. But it really isn't like that. Um, and they also say it's going to change the world. Well, if it really comes to be, it is going to change the world. Then make no mistake about it. Quantum computing can really be a huge change for the world but it still needs to happen first. And I want to give you some quick facts to sort of give you some real world information here other than the hype, and that is that a practical quantum computer requires thousands of so-called logical qubits. A normal computer has bits, a quantum computer has qubits. Logical qubits themselves are, consist out of tens of thousands of physical qubits, and physical qubits are things that are electronics that implement this qubit, and they do something quantum. I'm not a physicist, I don't understand what they do. Um, and Google's quantum supremacy machine had 53 physical qubits. So how supreme is that? That's like a baby step. We build something and it can do something a little bit, but it's not gonna change the world right now. There are orders of magnitude between what Google can do now and what we need in order to have a practically applicable quantum computer. Now, the goal of my talk is to poke a little bit through the hype and tell you why you should care about quantum computing and what you should be doing in the near future if you're doing identity management, because it is going to affect all of you. 
So why should we worry about quantum? Well, we should worry about quantum because of these two guys. On the left, you see Love Grover. On the right, Peter Shore. I'm going to explain to you what, the, uh, what both of these guys have developed and why the, what it has to do with quantum computing. And I'm going to start with Love Grover because he uh, created something that we call Grover's algorithm, and this improves random searches on black box functions. That sounds like a lot of computer science, right? I'm a computer science professor. I can't help myself. Uh, and um, it, there's even a square root sign on this slide. Um, the thing to take away from this is that it improves random searches. And random searches is something you want to do if you want to break uh, symmetric cryptography. If I have a symmetric key, say AES, that I use for, uh, I don't know, for digital signatures, the little thing that's in the, the chip that you have on your bank card, um, if you want to break that, you are basically, you can do no better than random guesses. But what this algorithm does is it re reduces the number of guesses that you need to do from n to the square root of n. So that is a huge reduction in the number of searches that I need to do. And what this boils down to is that it reduces the strength of, for example, AES at 128 bits, which is an algorithm that is used a lot, is reduced to 64 bits of security. And that's bad. That's breakably bad. So we need to do something. So what is the impact on identity and access management? So symmetric crypto is used all over the place. If you do things like one-time passwords, they are typically based on symmetric cryptography. Uh, challenge response, uh, encrypting stuff that, is on, uh, uh, that you store in a database, you're using symmetric cryptography for that. But what should you do? Well, you shouldn't panic and just double the key size and you're done. Um, if you use AES-256, if you take the square root of that, you get 128 bits. That's good enough for the next 30 years. So you really shouldn't be worrying. Uh, and that's also the, the, the takeaway from this slide, right? Generally speaking, we are not that worried about Grover's algorithm, even though it is a huge improvement on the state of the art. So if you are worried about quantum, I hope I, you can breathe a sigh of, let's do all breathe a sigh of relief in the roof, oh, we're, we're good, right? Uh, not quite, because we've got this guy, Peter Shore. And that's a, a nice picture of him that I grabbed off the internet. Um, what he does, uh, what this algorithm does, is, is it reduces the effort of factoring integers and solving discrete logarithms. These are things that we use in asymmetric cryptography. Read digital signatures, authentication with uh, uh, um, asymmetric algorithms. And this is really a big deal. Because this can break something like RSA 2048, which is something we use a lot for website security, which is what we use in identity federations for signing metadata or for uh, computing uh, signatures on SAML messages. Um, you can break that in hours, and that's an issue, right? So asymmetric crypto is used a lot in things like SAML, OpenID Connect, HTTPS, digital signatures. And a sufficiently powerful quantum computer would cause major problems for all of these. Um, so Shor's algorithm actually requires us to take action. We need to do something, because if that quantum computer comes to be, all of this asymmetric crypto will be broken, and we need to change our algorithms. But when you need to take action really depends on your use case. Um, I put up a little table here and I highlighted two things in bold face. So, so those are algorithms that are get used a lot. Um, actually, elliptic curve cryptography, ECC, is uh, affected even worse by Shor's algorithm. So it's, it's easier to break than RSA. Um, but the takeaway is here we're talking hours and not years like we're talking now or maybe even decades to break those key strings. Okay, so the most frequently used algorithms can be broken in hours. But the number of qubits required is still much, much larger. We're talking, I, I did a back of the envelope calculation during lunch, about seven orders of magnitude larger. We need that many more qubits. And physicists don't even know if this will ever be possible. But let's assume that we get enough smart physicists in a room and they manage to pull this off. When will that happen? That will take decades, probably. So are we safe? Well, that depends on how long you use this cryptographic data for. If you have short-term use, so transactional use, you probably have nothing to worry about. You should only change this when this quantum computer comes to be, and then you can change your technology and switch to a different algorithm. But for longer-term use, and I'm going to talk about them in the context of identity and access management in a minute, 
uh, you want to start thinking about transitioning now. You want to start thinking about transitioning. You don't want to start transitioning, you want to think about it. Right? No need for panic, no need for immediate action, but you do need to start working on this. In identity and access management for authentication. For authentication, we rely on public key cryptography, like I already said, SAML, OpenID, Connect, you name it. I put a picture of uh, the identity federation that I use on a daily basis because I work in academia. Um, and we have two types of signing here. We have transactional signing, so I, I, I authenticate. For that, I need to create a digital signature, and this is sent uh, uh, to a relying party to verify that my identity is correct. And we need to sign metadata for identity federations, sort of to bind all of the uh, identity providers together and all of the service providers together. But actually, these signatures have very limited lifetimes, right? The transactional signature is valid for a couple of hours if I have single sign-on. Uh, and uh, the signatures that I use in the metadata for my identity federation, well, maybe they're valid for a year. But that's not really something I worry about because I sign them again next year and I can just replace my uh, uh, algorithm by something that is quantum resistant uh, once this quantum computer comes to be. So, take away, there is no short-term ur urgency to address this threat of quantum computing for authentication. For non-repudiation, it's different. Um, because depending on the application, binding digital signatures have much longer lifetimes, right? Within the Euro uh, European Union, we have legally binding digital signatures, which I can use to buy a house or to buy uh, uh, other forms of property. Those, those contracts live for decades, right? If I buy a house, then in, in 40 years' time, I still want to be able to prove that that's my house. So here, if you make qualified electronic signatures, you want to start thinking about transitioning. You may need to, before this quantum computer comes to be, at least transition and prove that your existing signatures were created in a period uh, when no quantum computer existed that could break these signatures. Because these things have lifetimes spanning years or decades, you already need to start thinking about what you would do in order to, to transition this. Um, and that's also the takeaway, right? You need to start thinking about alternative signature schemes. Now, the good thing is that uh, scientists and technology standards bodies are already thinking about this. And this is called, and this is where we get to the post in post quantum, this is called post quantum cryptography. Um, and cryptographers are working on new public key algorithms that are quote unquote, quantum safe. That means if a sufficiently powerful quantum computer ever becomes available, you can still not break these algorithms within a reasonable amount of time. And the post in post quantum simply means after a quantum computer comes to be, and that's why I put the quote from the dictionary on that slide. The idea is that they remain secure, and the development states of these algorithms come from ripe to very green. Uh, and this also makes it really hard to make decisions, right? Because if you want to choose a new algorithm, you don't want to switch from something that you know is secure, like RSA or elliptic curve cryptography, go to this brand new algorithm and then the next year it turns out to be broken uh, and uh, you have a problem. Um, another issue with this is, and I, I couldn't resist putting this up on National Coming Out Day, uh, for some algorithms, every key can only be used once, for example. That's an issue. That doesn't scale very well if you need to create millions of signatures. Some require much more CPU power or much more memory. Some algorithms have much larger keys or much larger signatures. And this has consequences for applications. If you are, I was talking to somebody who, who ran the Identity Federation that I use on a daily basis, and I said, well, if you had to spend double the amount of time on uh, computing uh, some transactions, how would this impact you? And he said, well, that would be a serious problem because we need to buy additional hardware. We need to uh, set up additional machines to process all of those transactions. We in academia always start our academic year in September, and in September they have a peak in logins because all of the students need to register for courses, they need to buy their books, uh, and you need to be able to deal with that peak load even if you have algorithms that have much higher requirements on any of these parameters. So that is why you need to start thinking about this. Um, so 
the National Institute for Standards and Technology in the US is actually helping out there. Uh, there is a competition that they have launched to find secure quantum safe algorithms for different applications. So encryption, key exchange and signatures. Uh, and in uh, uh, identity and access management, you should care about encryption and signatures. Uh, key exchange is something that you use in the background, but it's less relevant for the technologies that you uh, use on a daily basis. The end goal of this competition is to standardize secure and suitable algorithms, and we are currently in the final round of this competition. So that's round three. The first standards are expected in the year 2022. So they hope to have the first standardized uh, uh, post-quantum algorithms for encryption, key exchange, and signatures. The fact that NIST is working on this means that it's a matter of when and not if we are going to transition to these algorithms. Because the problem is now is that once NIST standards exist, the US and other governments are going to start requiring the use or at least support for the use of these algorithms in tenders. So they're going to ask technology companies that provide solutions that use public key cryptography, hey, you need to support these algorithms. NIST has standardized them. Um, and even though it will likely take years uh, before the complete transition is done, um, this is going to impact internet industries, including identity and access management. You're going to encounter this at some point. Okay, so I've told you what might be coming towards you. What is it that I should do if I am a user or a reseller, or if I am a vendor? Well, if you're a user or a reseller, you want to check the little fine print on the box of the uh, identity and access management solution that you bought and make sure that they at least use uh, a sufficiently strong AES so you can tick that box, it's probably easy. Um, but you should probably also ask vendors about their plans to transition to these uh, new technologies. Do, have they thought about this? Are they going to do this? What are their plans? When can you expect the next uh, generation of solutions? Do you need to buy new hardware? These are things that you need to start thinking about. This will start happening in the next couple of years. Um, if you use digital signatures, you may actually want to keep a close eye on NIST already, because as I said, if you have long-lived digital signatures, at some point you need to transition, because you really need to transition before that quantum computer exists. If you are a vendor, you, I guess, need to do more or less the same thing, but the other thing that you need to keep into account is performance. If algorithms are selected in this NIST competition that have uh, per performance requirements in terms of memory, CPU, or whatever, you need to change the product that you sell to deal with that. Okay, but most of all, what you should not do is let yourself be panicked by this hype, because powerful quantum computers are years, if not decades away, and there are physicists who believe that they will never come to be. Um, I am completely unqualified to judge whether this is realistic or not because I'm not a physicist, um, but it is absolutely a, 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 a real world scenario where they never come to pass, but people are working very hard on building them. And what I didn't have time for to talk about in this uh, presentation today is that it's not just the physicists who are building more powerful quantum computers, but the cryptographers are also building uh, um, smarter ways to break cryptography using quantum computers. So it's not just the quantum computer that's going to be, but the algorithms that are used to break cryptography are also being improved while the quantum computer doesn't exist yet. So that's just happening in the heads of cryptographers. So that gives you an idea of how smart these people are. Um, Treat any vendor claim. So if a vendor comes to you and says, you need to start acting now, treat that with the utmost suspicion because that's not the case. Don't let yourself be bamboozled by hypes, but still you need to take this transition seriously. It's going to be the biggest change in public key cryptography in decades, essentially since SSL was introduced in 1995. Uh, and so this is something that you should care about, but you shouldn't panic. Uh, and with that, I'm standing within, between you and drinks. If there are any questions, you can ask me now, or I will spend another 10, 15 minutes with the drinks. And I hope that was interesting for you. <laughs>